Tom, the fire at the California refinery was just absolutely enormous. What do they think caused it? Well, they know what caused it. There was a leak in an eight inch pipe that uh, started to grow and to grow. And uh, the trouble is when you're brewing this kind of fuel, and this, this is a device that actually creates what is called feedstock for gasoline, for diesel, for all the other things that they make there. What happens is it's brewed at a temperature way in excess of its ignition uh, point. So once it makes contact with the air, it smells the air and says, ah, time to burn. And it started burning and started burning. And what happened was uh, it got worse and worse and worse to the point that it basically incinerated the uh, central part of that facility to the point where, although Chevron won't talk about it, it's likely to be down for one to three months. And that will have a huge impact, already has had a huge impact on gasoline prices. Let me give you an example. Now that's up early this morning, mm -hmm. okay? As of early this morning, the statewide average is $3.99 a gallon. That's the average. That's up 16 cents from a week ago. San Francisco is at 407, up 16 cents. San Jose, 402, up 18 cents. Oakland at $4 is up uh, 19 cents. Wow. That's this morning. Wow. I drove by gas stations this morning that have higher prices this afternoon because they can raise them multiple times during the day. So as a result, we're seeing a price spike that is twice what we've seen in the last week in the entire country as it relates to other issues that may be involved in this, including a little bit of this. So we have a, a significant thing going on here, and we mm -hmm. don't really know because a lot of the gas that uh, is going to be higher price isn't in the uh, gas stations yet. Some of it is still in tanks waiting to be shipped. They don't carry that much in tanks, but they do have some. But in a few days, we're going to start seeing, most likely, a very huge spike in prices. How long do you think that's going to last for? Is this a short-term effect, or do you think this will be a long-term price? increase? Well, at least for the rest of this month, it's going to be significant. And the reason for that is, is that we're still in the summer driving season. Now, come Labor Day, there is a bit of a abatement of the amount of fuel that we use. But the problem is, when you think of what we lost here, uh, the Chevron Richmond refinery is one in eight gallons of fuel produced in the state of California. Wow. And we are at the time of year where we are importing a lot of fuel. So as a result, we were going to have to keep importing some of that fuel to make up for the lack. But the problem with that is that's more expensive fuel because we have to import it. It is a higher priced fuel. Mm -hmm. As a result, this is going to last well beyond Labor Day. The question is, is it going to be 18 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents? We just don't know that yet because we're not seeing uh, what the market is really going to say about that. As distasteful as, as higher gas prices for all of us is going to be, what's the environmental and the health fallout for the people there in Richmond? I mean, this, this was a, a true disaster. Well, I think the problem here is that we don't know what the uh, real consequences of it are. We do know that there was a huge plume of smoke that went up pretty high in the air and blew all the way across Richmond, across the East Bay Hills, and into the East Bay far beyond that. So we know that there is going to be two kinds of things. We know that there are going to be the fumes and, and all of that, and that is something very hard to determine at this point in time. And then there's the particulate fallout, which is really bad for your lungs, not to mention uh, it gets down on other things in the food supply and all of that stuff. So we don't really know what all of that means just yet, but we do know that um, this is an accident that by any standard simply should not have happened. You can have accidents at refineries. This one was a biggie. Well, that is the question. I mean, what is, the, because this seems to happen periodically over mm -hmm. a number of years. They have these accidents. What's, what's the excuse? I, I heard there were people lining up to file lawsuits well. against, against them. Are they going to have a claim? Well, some of them are going to have a claim. I think some are going to have provable losses. Some are going to be able to say that they were not well and they did not go to work. Some are going to actually have hospital bills that they can show. Now, is there going to be a certain number of people, as we saw in Katrina and as we've seen in other things, people that are going to try to ride, as we saw in San Bruno, for example, mm -hmm. that are going to try to ride that pony and try to get some sort of money out of it? Sure, there are going to be those kinds of people, but that is not going to be the thing that we should focus on. What we need to focus on back again is the fact that this ever happened at all. This is a major emitter of uh, pollution mm -hmm. here in the Bay Area, but that's one of the prices you pay for living in the Bay Area. We have a big airport that pollutes a lot. Mm -hmm. We have uh, refineries that pollute a lot, utilities that pollute a lot. Now, not enormously like they used to do, but they're still the major points of uh, of pollution, including our own cars, which are probably the largest source of all. Yeah. But the reality of the situation is, is that, yeah, there are going to be lawsuits and a lot of things are going to be um, shaken out. What is interesting, though, is that Chevron has now laid itself a little bit bare in a way that it doesn't want to because no uh, Chevron person are going into that area without being accompanied by some sort of investigator or something like that. So as a result, uh, we're going to learn the real cause of this and we're going to learn a lot of things and uh, Chevron's going to have to live with that. 
sadly for it, this happened in its own hometown, being headquartered in Richmond. Great, thanks so much, Tom. Um, we we hope you'll keep us uh, updated on what happens. Yeah. Now, there's been another disturbing story this week. The deadly shooting by a white supremacist at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin has brought renewed attention to both hate crimes and the guns used to perpetrate them. In a moment, we'll discuss the latest gun control measure being debated at the state capitol. But first, we hear from a Sikh leader who says that this shocking crime is only the latest in a series of attacks against the Sikh community since 9-11. With more than 9,000 members, Gurdwara Sahib in Fremont is one of the largest Sikh temples in the Bay Area. This week, congregants are in a state of shock and grief for those lost in the shooting. I mean, the first reaction is that we are trying to hold prayers every morning and evening for at least a week. It's, it's very heart-wrenching when we have to go through these episodes as a community because even our kids ask us point blank, what happened there? How do we explain to those? After 9-11, most of the stereotyping based upon the way the Sikh appearances is are, have been picked out as, as a community which stands out purely because of the way we look, right? So I think our effort as a community is to do more outreach programs with our neighbors. We want to go more into an education mode. And meanwhile, we expect that the, that the government also proactively helps us to, to, to certify these cases as really hate crimes, which a lot of time they don't just classify them as hate crimes. And they never go up and they never get that sort of a coverage. So had this been a single guy being shot in some remote area, it wouldn't have got that much of news and coverage. And we really appreciate and thank the media this time that it really brought this issue at the forefront. The shootings at the Sikh Temple, as well as the recent shootings in a Colorado movie theater, have renewed the debate over gun control. Now, here in California, State Senator Leland Yee has introduced a bill to clamp down on guns even further. Now, Josh, California already has the most stringent ban on assault weapons in the country. That's right. So why does Senator Yee feel that the current laws are inadequate? Well, there's a loophole. And uh, Senator Yee had actually introduced this bill initially in May, long before e either of these mass shooting incidents occurred. The loophole basically deals with something that, that's called a bullet button. Uh, the, the law as it exists uh, says that uh, magazines that can be removed by a normal push button, uh, as, as would no ordinarily happen, in combination with other features like a telescoping stock or a pistol grip, are already banned mm -hmm. under California's law. Uh, the law essentially requires that magazines be fixed in the gun or and require some sort of tool or uh, to remove or replace them in order to slow down the reloading process mm -hmm. Uh, what, what some gun manufacturers started doing was selling these kits to modify that button so that you would have to use the, either the tip of a bullet or a magnet that you would pass over it, uh, thus using a tool, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be done in seconds, essentially. You put this kit on there and you can, you can change the magazine out just as fast as you would have under other circumstances. Senator Yee's bill seeks to ban that kind of mechanism, essentially. He introduced it in May. I, I talked to him last night about this, and he said he really didn't see a lot of enthusiasm for it at first. People didn't really want to take on the gun lobby over something like this. Um, and he had actually started watering down the bill somewhat. He had amended it. And then after the Colorado shooting happened, where you were dealing with a very large capacity magazine in, in an assault rifle, uh, suddenly there was renewed interest. So he re-amended it back to its original uh, uh, configuration, essentially, and also got an endorsement from the attorney, state attorney general this week and, right. and is sort of going full bore with it now. But that's not even the only piece of legislation we've got pending now. A, a, a group of Bay Area lawmakers this week introduced new legislation uh, dealing with ammunition sales so that any vendor who is selling or otherwise furnishing more than a thousand rounds to a single individual within five days would have to notify police of, of that sale uh, within 24 hours of, of reaching that, that thousand round number. Uh, and they say this is an effort to, to crack down on huge sales. The, the, color, the alleged Colorado gunman had somewhere in excess of 6,000 6, rounds right. on, you know, right. that, that, that he had available, that he had uh, amassed in a relatively short time. Uh, and then there's also uh, a bill that's been pending since January to add long guns, rifles and shotguns, to the already existing ban on the open carry of unloaded handguns, which is a law that just took effect this year. What does that mean, open carry? Open carry uh, is, uh, it, it, it's, it, 
by most accounts, it's it's an expression of uh, of Second Amendment rights mm -hmm. that that some people took to to uh, undertook as a means of showing that it's illegal to concealed carry for for most people. You have to go through a very stringent permitting process, and a lot of people get denied here in California for for concealed carry. But the, the law did used to allow for carrying a, a, a an unloaded handgun openly, meaning on your belt where it's easily visible. Uh, in public places, and so uh, gun enthusiasts, gun rights enthusiasts, began showing up in public places, having meetings with their guns. That got banned. Some of them started showing up with shotguns and rifles instead to prove the point. <laughs> now they're trying to ban that. So, uh, a question about this: You said that because of the shooting, it has a better chance of passage, mm -hmm. but our memories tend to be very short in this country. Indeed. So, how quickly do you think they'll be able to get it through? Do you think there's enough? impetus to do it really fast? Well, it, 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 for, for Senator Yee's bill, it may be a good thing that the legislative session is drawing to a close soon. You know, th this is a bill, because he had introduced it in May, it had already gone through some committees. Because it's been amended and re-amended, it would have to go back on concurrence, back to the Senate. It's currently pending in the Assembly. Um, but, but there's time enough to get that done. The bill that was first introduced this week probably a little bit more of a long shot to get it done before the legislature adjourns. And by the time we get back, you know, in the next right. session, who knows where, where people's minds are going to be. I talked to former Senator Pro Tem uh, Don Parada, mm -hmm. and he said that, um, he said, you know, he's out of office, but he said, look, he says, trying to ban uh, these kinds of weapons in the state of California is foolish. He says, shouldn't even try. He says, what we should try for are these kinds of things where we put reasonable regulations on these things mm -hmm. and then enforce those reasonable regulations. Uh, the problem is, the other side, which is to say the people that support kind of the unlimited use and carry of guns, mm -hmm. don't support any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I talked today to a couple of, of Second Amendment rights uh, in, enthusiasts and, and attorneys, actually, and they were basically saying, you know, I, I, I think the California Rifle and Pistol Association guy, Chuck Michelle, put it best, you know, for, for their side of the argument, which is none of these bills would have done anything to, to keep crazy people from committing crimes. And, and to some extent, that's true. Um, and, and, and there have been a lot of calls for expanding mental health checks uh, uh, on, on people who are buying guns and ammunition. But the fact is, you know, the, uh, the, the weapon that was used in Colorado is something that would have been banned under the old federal assault weapons ban, which Senator Feinstein is now trying to revive in Washington. And that 100-round drum magazine that he had, which luckily jammed, uh, is a, a very high-capacity uh, magazine that, that we probably we, we wouldn't be able to have here in California under the existing law. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, Josh. But let's move to another legal battle <laughs> happening here in California. This time, it's between two tech giants, Apple and Samsung, and the whole drama is playing out inside a San Jose courtroom. So, Laura, what is this lawsuit all about? Well, I think you know you can trace it back perhaps to the late Steve Jobs, who was so furious about the Android system and the Samsung phones because he felt they were copying Apple's designs. And he said, I'm willing to go thermonuclear on this, and I'm willing to spend every penny that Apple has to stop this, because he felt that these phones had ripped him off. So I'm going to give you, I, I brought here uh, my iPhone, and uh, I'm going to quickly go in here and show you, for example, the kinds of patents that we're talking about. So if you go into your, your phone here, and you have, uh, go into the contacts, and you'll see there's a bounce like that. That bounce, Apple says we have a patent on that. that that's patented. That's patented. The bounce. Yeah, and this was discussed today in court, this particular patent. And in fact, um, the Samsung phones, they had this for a while. I believe you have well, one. Now that you speak of the devil, <laughs> I actually have a Samsung phone. You have a Samsung phone. So uh, should this thing bounce as well? Uh, it did, it but it no longer does as a result of what's no going on in court. <laughs> so awesome. they are fighting over things like this, over the shape of, of the phones. I mean, you'll notice that your phone also has kind of rounded edges, and it has uh, this kind of nice rectangular, you know, rounded shape. They say we mm -hmm. have a patent on that as well. Okay. So, and there's no doubt, Apple makes incredibly elegant products, and that after the iPhone came out in 2007, you started to see other smartphones look like it. The question here really is whether or not, just because they were inspired by the iPhone, does it mean they really violated 
the patents, mm -hmm. and that's what they're fighting about in court. So this this last couple weeks, Apple, each side has 25 hours to make their case. Mm -hmm. The judge put limits on this, and Apple has been bringing in design experts and showing how they came up with these de designs and they were original. Samsung is going to try and counter back that, in fact, these designs were not original. They were inspired by other designs. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I have gone back and looked at previous patents, and Patent examiners maybe have a couple days sometimes to decide if something's original, and so some of Apple's patents may not be, but some may be. So that's going to be what the jury's going to have to decide. In so this it's case. not just Apple suing Samsung, though. Samsung is countersuing. So what are their claims they, about? They are, and the thing to understand about these companies is that they walk around with these big satchels of patents. Really, <laughs> you, you know, they've been spending you know millions and millions of dollars to buy patents, and so Samsung's dragging some out of its sack, and it has what patents that are considered essential to all phones. Mm -hmm. So it therefore actually has to license these patents under law. If you have patents that, are, that have become a standard in the industry, you must license them. The question is for how much. Apple is saying, Samsung is saying, you're not paying us enough for our patents. Mm -hmm. And Apple is saying, you're asking too much. So that is another issue in this case. Now, normally, these big giants, they'll settle these cases. But in this instance, I think because going back to this history, Apple has not been willing to settle. You know, one of the things, I, I was talking to a patent attorney who teaches at a law school, and she told me, she says, what's really changed here is uh -huh. that this isn't really about patents anymore, that this has become, the patent lawsuit is becoming a strategic weapon against competitors to either keep their products out of the market or to gain some sort of advantage over them that really has nothing to do with innovation, has nothing really to do with uh, improving the product, but it has to do with disciplining uh, your competitors in a way that they simply cannot get around. Well, I think, I think there's some truth to what she's saying, that we're seeing a lot of that. I'm sure Apple doesn't feel that that's what they're up to here, but certainly if they can keep other people out of the market, it gives them an advantage. Or if they just make it more difficult for Samsung to have to design around them, it just makes it difficult. It gives Apple the reputation of being an, in an innovator, which Apple wants, but you know, one should remember that Steve Jobs was fond of saying, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal. <laughs> so, um, so one has to remember that history with, with Apple. This is a complicated case and you know in the end it comes down to lots of little patents. I don't know if I'd want to be that jury sitting there. I think the judge uh, offered them coffee this week uh, <laughs> when looking over. Keep to them, them awake going over all the patents, right? Uh, yeah, it's fascinating it, it, meeting it's, at night. It's tough but in, in the end you know uh, we were talking earlier about consumers. Unfortunately these suits cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And will that impact consumers bottom line? The, it may very well. I mean where's Samsung going to put this money? They're going to put it in the price of your phone. Mm -hmm. And choice. And choice, because there already have been uh, actually some injunctions put on some of the Samsung products. Okay. So. Well, thanks so much, Laura. It'll be fascinating to watch this legal battle play out inside the courtroom.